Hey there, Fall Aesthetic fans. Welcome back to the Andromeda Doom Devlogs, episode one. If you'd like to skip ahead to the content, check the timestamps in the description. In this episode, I will be presenting a tutorial on how to build a mobile touch joystick using Godot and C Sharp. Mobile touch joysticks are something beginner game devs always want to learn how to do, but good tutorials I find are quite sparing. Now, following the tutorial, I'm going to be discussing the first week of my game dev progress on the full game in Andromedoom. I'm going to discuss what the changes are from the prototype introduced in the previous episode. I'm going to be discussing what the vertical slice that I'm going to be building involves. And finally, I'm going to show you the program that I put together. Well, without further ado, let's get started with the tutorial. Make sure that you can export to your touchscreen device before we continue. And the first thing I'm going to show is the starting scene. Okay, so here's the introductory scene. I'll run through the hierarchy of this level. The first one is the level manager. That's just a simple node and, and just used to group the children. The first child is the floor object, which is just a mesh instance with a generated cube, underneath which is a static body definition defined by four collision shapes. And these collision shape cubes define the invisible walls of the level. They prevent the playoff and the aliens from moving outside of the floor. The third child is the camera origin node and underneath which is just the camera. Just the default node settings for this tutorial. And finally, there is the player kinematic body node underneath which is a 3D mesh which looks like the classic Space Invaders player pad and a collision shape and a box collision shape on the mesh. Now for this tutorial, the collisions don't really matter. At the end, we'll be tying the touch joystick to the movement of the player pad, but it's not strictly necessary if you just want to follow along with the scripting. So the first thing we're going to do is put in the UI controls. And to do that, we need to add a child node canvas. This is for UI elements. Underneath which we're going to be putting a control node. Now what we want our control node to do is anchor the buttons onto the bottom edge of the screen. So we're going to go to layout and we're going to choose bottom wide. And this will align the control node with the bottom edge of the screen. Now the next thing we're going to do is add a sprite. Now underneath this control road node, we're going to add a child sprite. This will form the base of the joystick. And let's just rename it to joystick base. And for the texture, we're just going to drag and drop this one here. What you'll notice is the anchor is at the center of the sprites and it is sitting at the bottom left of the control. What we want to do here is switch off the centered anchor. This will make it easier with the touch screen button, which we will be using with the Ford joystick. Now the base is sitting below the screen and what we want to do is just reset the position based on the size of the texture. And we can later do this dynamically in code if the size of the sprite should change. Now let's press play and see what we get. As you can see, you've got the joystick base at the bottom corner, but if we were to resize the window, it'll always stay at the bottom left corner. The next step is adding a touch screen button and this will form the interactable part of the touch joystick. So add a child node, touch screen button. Let's rename it to joystick and for this joystick it's going to be two sprites first is the standard control the black one and then the pressed button now touchscreen buttons don't work on the shape of the sprite so what you need to do is add a circle shape 2d new circle shape 2d click into it and increase the radius in this case 
we can make it the full size or maybe we shrink it down to 96 for example and that will be the touch zone okay great now let's see if the touch screen actually works what you need to do is go into project settings scroll down to input devices pointing and click emulate touch from mouse and as you can see the touch screen button responds to the mouse click now this is the part you're all waiting for let's get on to the scripting attach a script so let's call this the scripts folder change the language to c-sharp inherits the touch screen button and we'll click create now what we want to do is find the screen position of the player's touch and then translate that into a vector that we pass on to the player pad. So the first step is getting touch input data. And the way we do this is through the input function. So type public override void underscore input. Now by default, Godot uses the ampersat operator and what this does it allows the event word to behave as a parameter rather than the intrinsic c sharp keyword event however i don't like this so i will change it to input event now we can reference the input event object called on this input cycle by the term input event now not every input is going to relate to the joystick. It's gonna be a fire button, there's gonna be a touch camera control, and so on. So what we wanna do is filter out everything else. And what we do is, if the touch button is not pressed, I'm just gonna use the bang operator. We're just gonna return out of this function and that's that however if it is pressed then we need to find the screen position because C sharp is statically typed you can't reference properties that do not belong to this type of class unless you cast it to the appropriate subclass so input event dot position doesn't work because not every input event has a position uh, property. So what you need to do is check if the input event that we are referencing is a screen touch event. So, and the syntax for this is if input event is input event and the type that we're interested in, not so much screen touch, we can ignore that but a screen drag. If the input event is of the type input event screen drag, and we're gonna cast this to the parameter called drag events, then we will pass control flow into the following. Let's add some comments. Comments may be a little unnecessary. I like to code in a self-documenting way, but we'll leave them in for now. Now, what we wanna do is move the touch joystick button to the location of the touch screen event and the way we do this is by referencing now keep in mind this script is attached to the touch screen button so we could type this dot global position and what we want to do is set it to the drag event dot position property this keyword is quite redundant but I'll keep it in for now let's see what we've done here now, as you can see, the touch screen button now moves to the location of the touch input. However, you'll notice there's a problem that was foreshadowed earlier, and that is the touch screen button's coordinate is to the top left of the assigned sprites. We can fix this in code. Now, what we can do is at runtime, when the node enters the scene tree, 
we can find the rest texture and cache the dimensions of that texture size and subtract it from the position value. And what this will do, or subtract it by half the position value. And what this will do is correct for that offset. So what we can do is create a field private vector two. We'll call it button size. We'll just leave it at that. And then we'll get button size is equal to a new vector two. So what are the parameters? Well, we need the pressed button texture. So it doesn't need to be the pressed button texture. You can use the normal. Normal dots get width. That'll return the width. And then the normal dot get height. Very good. And now what we do in this instance is just subtract it by the button size, multiply by half. Oops. So let's test this out. Now you can see the texture is at the middle of the mouse button click. Very good. Now the next step is to constrain the joystick from straying too far from the joystick base. If it's out of bounds, Constrain the button. And the way we do this is we check if the position. Now let's make a distinction here. The global position in this instance is relative to the top left corner of the screen. Global position. This position here is relative to the node's parent. So what we want to do is make sure that if this is the joystick base, we don't want the joystick to be a certain distance away from the center of that base, which is why in this instance, we are using the position property, not the global position, as in this case. And what we do is check the length of that position, which is the, ve which is the size of the vector from with the origin at the joystick base. And what we want to do is create a arbitrary value that we can adjust. And the best way to do that is with a, a field that is exported to the editor. So we can adjust it on the fly. To export fields to the editor, you use the export attribute. And what we want is a float. Oh no. What we want is actually an integer because it's a pixel value. And we're just gonna call it boundary. And we're gonna default it to about 96. And so if we return to our code here, we're gonna be checking if the size of the vector, the offset from the joystick base is greater than the boundary. Well, if it is, what do we do then? Well, what you want to do is uh, clamp it to the size of the boundary. The way to do that is just resetting the position property. Position is equal to position dot normalized. This will give us the direction of the original vector. And then you multiply it by the length of the boundary, which is by definition, the maximum offset from the base. And that's about it. Now, the last thing when it comes into interactivity is returning the joystick to the center of the base when the touch is released. Be very careful here. Now let's return to the code. So your first instinct might be to say, else if this is not a drag event, set the position back to vector zero, which is the origin of 
the joystick base. This won't work because if it's not a drag event, it could still be a touch event and you don't want that to happen because every touch will reset the joystick to zero. Okay, well, let's try something else here. Okay, well, now you might be thinking, well, we can put this logic in here. If the button is not being pressed, we can just reset its position. And this seems reasonable and it'll actually work. It looks, it appears that it's working. If you were to let go of the joystick button, it does reset its position. However, let's head on over to the touch screen and see what happens. You can see the joystick moving to the touch input. However, letting go of the joystick will not reset it to the middle. So we need to fix that. You may have figured out what hap what's happening here. In the touch screen emulation, on the desktop computer, the input function is always being called. So this line of code that resets the position back to, so this line of code that resets the position back to zero is always being called. And the reason the input function is being called is because the computer has a mouse, which always feeds data. So on every frame, the input function is executed and the position is reset to zero if the button is not pressed. However, on a touchscreen device, this does not happen because all this code will only execute if there is an input event, which in this context is a screen touch, which is why touching elsewhere on the screen while the button is offset resets it back to zero. So what's the fix for this? It's very simple. Rather than putting it on the input function, we want it to execute every frame. This is where we put it in the process, uh, in the process function. And it's just a matter of copying this line of code and pasting it in here. And that will work. And we can reset this back to return. Now you can see that releasing the joystick will reset it back to zero as we want it. And this also works when emulating the touch input on the computer. Okay, we're nearly there. Now to connect the joystick output to the player, I'm gonna be using the Godot signal pattern and we're gonna be use, building this in code not using the editor. I think it's a good way to get the hang of how signals work in C Sharp. Now the way this works is we create a delegate function with the signal attribute. So we'll type signal and we'll create a public delegate void. And what we'll call this is send joystick. And what we do here is we specify the parameters that we're going to be sending to the player node. In this case, the only parameter we need to send is the vector. Vector two, let's just call it output. And that's it. So now we've got the signal function. What you need to do next is connect it to the player node. First thing is to get a reference to the player node. Let's type in node player node equals. Now we have to start from the hierarchy. We've got the root level above this, underneath this is the level manager, and underneath that is the player. So that will be the necessary part. Get tree dot root. That will send us to the root. And then we get a node. And the path of this, is a string level manager that's the first node player and this will return a reference back to the player node and the next thing we want to do is connect the signal so you use the connect function you type the name of the delegate function which is send joystick the next thing you pass is the target object which in this case is the player node 
Now, this is the bit where it gets a bit tricky because what we need to provide is a string, which is the name of the method on the target object script, which we haven't created yet. We'll just call it receive joystick. And we need to keep this in mind because when we write up the player script, we'd have to use that method name. So all we've done so far is connect the signal to the player node, but we're not calling that signal just yet. And what we're gonna do is in the process function, emit the signal every frame. And to do that, you just use the emit signal method. Type the name of the signal that you want to emit. In this case, it is send joystick. Now we pass the arguments array, which is based on the parameters specified in the delegate function. And in this instance, what we're passing is the position of the touch joystick relative to the joystick base, but we are also dividing it by the boundary size. So it's between zero and one and the maximum size of this vector is constrained by that boundary. So if you move the joystick a little bit off the base, you get a smaller vector. So you can move more finely. So the next thing we'll do is we'll create a small script just to move the player. Just notice the typo in my code. Make sure there is no slash here because this roots property will automatically add a slash in front of that string. So let's return to our editor, go to player and attach a script. The scripts folder, we'll just call it the player script for now. Uh, in C sharp, kinematic body, create. Now remember in our old script, we created a receive joystick uh, method. So we'll have to create this method for this script. So we'll create a private void receive joystick function, which will take a parameter, which is the vector to received joystick. The parameter emitted in the signal so what gets passed as an argument into this parameter here. Now what we want to do is create a field private vector2 and we'll just call this joystick input and this will uh, keep track of the inputs, keep track of the values we're getting out of the joystick and it's just a matter of setting joystick input to the received joystick. So now we move and collide the player pad based on the received joystick input. Now, the way to do this is through the physics process because ultimately we'll want to process collisions. So public override void and physics process here. And all we really need to do is use the move and collide function which takes a vector three, a three dimensional vector, not a vector two, which is what we're being fed from the joystick. It's best to create an intermediate vector that will behave as an intermediary before between the input and the moving collide function. We'll initialize this to zero. That way, all we need to do is update the properties. Movement dot X is equal to joystick input dot x. So now this is the tricky part. Movement dot z should actually receive the y input because Godot's convention is to have the vertical direction as y and the 2D plane as x and z. Now all we need to do is move and collide the player pad using the movement vector. Now let's test it out. And as you can see, the player pad responds to the touch joystick. However, it is flying across the screen. 
And the reason for this is we didn't account for the time increment of the physics process. So it's just a matter of multiplying the player in movement by delta. And as you can see, that's a lot better. But what you'd want to do is export and export a field for the player pad speed so you can adjust as you see fit. And the way we do this, just create a with the export attribute, a private float, call it speed. Maybe we'll just double the speed for now. And then here we can multiply the input to the movement collide function. Much better. Let's head on over to the touch screen and test that out. You can see the player pad moving around and when letting go of the joystick, it stops moving as expected. Now we're 90% of the way there, but there's one more issue that again could only be picked up if you test it on a touch screen. Let's say I am moving the player pad and then touching the other end of the screen where the fire button would be. The player pad is jittering. So as we saw, the touch screen button is jittering in the event of two touches. Now, I don't know if this is a problem with Godot or with Android, but this could not be fixed using touch indexes. Index of one touch is not guaranteed to match the index registered to that same touch, that same physical touch onto the next frame. So checking for touch indexes in this context is not gonna fix this problem. There is not an, there is no foolproof solution to this that I found and if there is, please let me know. But the way I fix this is quite simply just to set an ignore zone. What this will do is if the drag event is on the other side of the screen, if it's far enough away from the joystick, then we just ignore this function call. We export a distance called ignore. And I'm gonna set it to 512 in this instance. 512 pixels. And before we set the position, we check to see if the drag event's position minus the global position of the touchscreen button. Now this is a vector. So what we want is its length. It's greater than the ignore value. So let's have a look at what we did here. So the drag event position, subtracting it from the global position of the touch joystick button, that returns the vector. If the length of that vector is greater than 512 in this instance, we just return out of the function. So we don't respond. And with that, the script is complete. So now our final joystick, touching the right hand side of the screen will no longer cause a jittering. However, be mindful that if you were to stray too far, your finger would need to go back to reset the joystick. So adjust the ignore distance as you see fit. That's all I had for today. Thank you for watching along and hopefully you enjoyed that tutorial and took away something from it. Final tutorial took a lot longer than I thought. Even when recording, I had spent a lot of time debugging the script. But the tutorials that I enjoy watching take you through on the journey to arrive at the solution. They write the script line by line and sh test along the way. And that's how I intend on presenting my own tutorials. If you'd like to see the finished script and the Godot assets that you can then import directly into the Godot engine, check the description. I've left a link for the download. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions on improving the code, please share them in the comment section below. And if you'd like to stick around and listen to the progress on the Andromedoom project, that's coming up next. But first, a word from our sponsor, me. 
I'm today's sponsor because I have no clout. And if you'd like to be an acolyte of Polysthetic, aka Polysthetite, head on over to polysthetic.threadless.com. You can get my logo plastered all over your chest, your shower curtains, your coasters, whatever your heart's content, Threadless will print on it. That's polysthetic.threadless.com. So in the last episode, I presented the Andromedoon prototype which is just a proof of concept for the core of the game. However, the finished product is obviously going to be a lot more advanced than what I presented. And what are these differences? Well, first of all, the art style is not going to be voxel. Now, voxel art is very quick and easy to produce, but because performance is a major consideration for mobile games, and voxel meshes are quite triangle heavy for the amount of detail that they represent, they're not the best way to go forward. Instead, the style I'm opting for is low poly meshes with low resolution pixel art textures. Now this is a tire style that is gaining a bit of traction in the 3D community. It's being popularized by the standalone app Crocotile and the Spritile plugin for Blender. Sometimes you'll see this art style being referred to as PS1 graphics because they are reminiscent of the 1990s Nintendo 64 PlayStation 1 era of 3D graphics. Gameplay wise, the prototype I showed was completely unforgiving. The player could not survive a single hit or a single alien landing. However, the full game will have a health system for both the aliens and the player, and obviously multiple lives which I'll discuss in a second, and also an invasion meter. Each alien will have some sort of score that they add to the invasion score, and if too many aliens land, the level is over. Of course, multiple difficulty levels will vary both the health, the invasion meter, and how many levels you can lose before losing the game. The levels themselves will be set on real world cities. And so rather than shields as shown in the prototype and taken from the original Space Invaders game, there will actually be real life city buildings. And the aim is not to how hide behind them, although that is an option, but rather to try and preserve the cities. You don't want to take too much damage to the buildings when completing a level. The intention of protecting the cities would would be to gain currency for completing the levels. And the better you performed in the level, the more money you win at the end. And you can use this money to to buy new ships. And those ships form your fleet, which forms the number of lives you have to complete the remainder of the game. Now the player ships will have their own statistics, so they might be more mobile or they might be more armored, more accurate, they might shoot more more frequently. But there's the uh, another system that I haven't discussed yet, and that will be custom weapons. So they won't just be the standard cannon that you saw in the prototype. Rather, I'm going to implement a weapon system, which will take colored dots, and pressing the dots in a correct combination will load a certain weapon onto the ship that you can then use. This is inspired by the system from the indie game Magicka. And so another parameter between the ships that you can unlock and buy as you progress through the game are the colored dots available to you. And finally, the game will progress from city to city in different regions in the world. For example, the first region will be the Asia Pacific region. and this will have six cities, five of them will be regular levels with invading aliens and the sixth will be a boss fight, which you vaguely saw as the first level was Sydney in the prototype, which just had the standard alien invasion and the final boss was in the Tokyo level. Each region will have its own particular style, its own group of aliens invading, its own color schemes and so forth. So the first step to completing the finished product is to build a vertical slice. And what that means is getting down all the mechanics and logic to a high level of polish 
with only the Asia Pacific world. Provided I can get that working, I can then add on the remainder of the worlds. So, the Americas, Europe, etc. I won't spoil it all now. And by doing this, by establishing a modular logic and program architecture early on, by adding on the content for the rest of the game, by the time I reach the end, the game should be 80% complete. Let me show you the programs and tools that I'm using to put this together. And a disclaimer, it is not that impressive. A lot of indie game devs like to recommend the likes of Trello, for example. I see that quite a lot, and it's a pretty software. However, I think that if you are working by yourself on a simple project, it's important not to get bogged down too much in the administrative overheads of that project. So the software I'm using is Microsoft OneNote and a program I put in Microsoft Excel. In addition to just my little art journal with all the notes and the sketches that I've pulled together over the months. So this is the Gantt chart I pulled together. That might seem rudimentary, but I work in an engineering company and some of our multi-million dollar projects are planned using Excel, using this technique. So don't be afraid of just simple solutions. And so the vertical slice I'm building is here. World number one, you can see in the blue that this is the parent task and the actual tasks are yellow. What I'm allowing for is about four weeks for art, which might be a little too optimistic, particularly for the cities. Maybe not for the aliens. That's about seven or eight 3D models, which is doable in a week. Likewise for the ships, four to five models. However, there's gonna be 36 models for the city buildings because there are six cities in that region or that world in the Super Mario lingo and six buildings in each city. So I imagine there will be some spill over here. Hoping not. And so once the art is complete, the next part is the assembly. A lot of this is rebuilding. The movement and the health has already can be carried over from the prototype. However, I will need to build and design the unlockable ships. So the fleet system, the weapon system needs a lot of work. And of course, the aliens themselves will be built better with finite state machines and more interesting AI. And of course, I would need to animate the models. It's not gonna be the simple Space Invaders clone that you saw in the prototype. Now pulling this off in two to three months would hopefully mean taking a lot of lessons learned and streamlining the process. Once we've built the UI, we can just take the art process and the assembly process and knock out each world in six to eight weeks. So hopefully within a year's time, I would have 80% of the project complete. It's optimistic, but maybe it's doable. Now there's two exceptions here. World six, I intend on being just bosses. So there will only be boss fights on that final uh, world, that region, which is yet to be designed. And secondly, there's a bigger mission here that you may have noticed, music and sound effects. I intend on making those myself and integrating them myself, but I haven't figured out how to do that just yet. The intention there is to have quite an ambient soundscape and the sound effects themselves will be melodies or musical notes that complement the ambient soundscape. So rather than hearing uh, explosions or projectile fires, you would hear, you would hear percussions or synth melodies, etc, etc. I haven't yet figured out how to pull this off or if I should pull it off. So music and sound will be the last thing that I put 
onto this project. Thank you for watching. That's all I had for this week's episode. I'm going to be trying to put out a new one every two, three, maybe four weeks, depending on how quickly I can work. If you have any comments, suggestions, questions, put them in that little box down below. Hit the like if you like. Please subscribe and hit the bell as well. Shout out to Fantano. And I'll see you in the next episode.